without further ado, I would like to introduce the wonderful Dr. Anne Pulsford, who will teach us about the unique and fascinating life of Dame Miriam Rothschild. I'll pass over to her to introduce tonight's talk. Okay, so tonight's talk is called The Life and Work of Dame Miriam Rothschild. And I became interested in her um, FRS and CBE. And I became interested in her because um, she worked on one of the parasites that I worked on for my PhD in marine biology, in parasitology at the Marine Biological Association in Plymouth, um, where I worked for about 30 years as um, a electron microscopist and then as a researcher in the effects of stress on the immune system of fish and mollusks. Um, and then as editor of the Journal of the Marine Biological Association. So I spent my whole working life at the Marine Biological Association in Plymouth. Um, I live in Tavistock, um, which is about 15 miles outside of Plymouth. And um, we're very fortunate that we haven't had many COVID cases. Um, so uh, without ado, I'll um, try and tell you something about the life and work of Dame Miriam Rothschild. So Miriam Rothschild was a 20th century pioneer of wildlife conservation and carried out research into parasitology, insect plant ecology and flea jumping and became an expert on fleas from a collection left to her by her father. Um, and this um, collection of pictures here shows her as a young woman um, and as a middle aged woman and as an older lady. And um, as you see, she had a very individual style of dressing. Miriam was also the great pioneer of wildflower gardening, which um, considering this was more than 30 years ago, was way ahead of its time. Um, and now this has become a very fashionable form of gardening, um, both for personal gardens and for um, public gardens. She developed an Ashton Wall where she lived, wildflower meadow mix, um, which she called Farmer's Nightmare. She was a great pioneer of planting wildflowers for the insects and butterflies she studied and loved. Miriam Rothschild studied butterflies, wildflowers and fleas and was at Bletchley Park for two years during World War II, where she met her husband. She had a very individual style, you might call bohemian um, or eccentric maybe. She wore flowing loose mauve silk dresses and matching headscarves. And here's a picture of her in her typical um, outfit. And someone said her strikingly colorful appearance, which with her red hair tied back with a headscarf, the full skirt and waistcoat was rather my idea of a gypsy queen. She didn't wear leather as she was a vegetarian. She wore moon boots in the winter, tennis shoes in summer, and also short white Wellington boots in the evening. And she wore these um, to meet the queen. A vegetarian, she did not drink or wear makeup, and she was very active in a wide range of civil, social, and political causes. And this is a picture of her wildflower mix in, uh, in flower, which is extremely beautiful. I wish my garden looked like that. Miriam Rothschild was born in 1908 in Ashton Wold near Arundel in Northamptonshire. She was the daughter of Charles Rothschild, family of Jewish bankers, and Rosiska Eddie Rothschild. She died there in 2005, aged 96, so she lived her whole life, apart from the time uh, when she was travelling or when she was at Bletchley Park during the Second World War. Her father, Charles Rothschild, had built a family house at Ashton Wold and rebuilt Ashton Village, Northamptonshire. As you know, for Rothschild, he's very wealthy. Charles Rothschild worked as a successful banker, taking over NM Rothschild and Sons Limited from the, his father, Nathaniel. Charles studied butterflies and fleas in his spare time, 
Zoology was his hobby. The ecology of moths, butterflies and fleas is what he really specialised in. And Miriam said, my development into a scientist was entirely due to my father, Charles, a first class scientist who discovered the flea vector of bubonic plague and more of that later. Charles was the first chairman of the Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves, which became the Wildlife Trust, which still exists today. Charles's aim was to identify Britain's finest wildlife sites for potential purchase as nature reser reserves, and he had plenty of money for these purchases. He founded the Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves, and in 1915 produced a list of 300 wildlife sites worthy of preservation and 284 key sites to be preserved in perpetuity, which became known as the Rothschild Reserves. Charles's legacy are individual reserves where species are protected like the UK swallowtail butterfly, Papillo Marchion Britannicus, on the Hickling Broad in Norfolk. Miriam as a child helped her father Charles butterfly collecting in Ashton Wall Woodlands. She also helped flea collecting from mice. And the Ashton Wall Woodlands, there were many old willow bushes, willow bushes, the habitat of butterflies, hair streaks, fritillaries, and purple emperors, which interested Charles. By the age of four, Miriam had started collecting ladybird beetles and caterpillars. She was very interested in all aspects of wildlife, like her father Charles and her uncle Walter. She played in Ashton Wold farmyard and milked cows. Age four, she was called Country Life by Country Life magazine, the youngest milker. Her father had described about 500 new species of flea, and her uncle Lionel Walter Rothschild had a, built a private natural history museum at Tring to house his collection of stuffed animals. He also had a collection of exotic animals which were in the grounds of his house. Her father and uncle were great influences on her life. Her father also acted as a tutor along with a governess. She read avidly and was tutored by a governess as her father Charles did not favor school. He took her on butterfly and flea collecting excursions. Natural history was a way of life. She said, my father took me along on collecting trips and treated me as an adult, not a child. Like Father Charles and Uncle Walter, Miriam loved animals and plants and was fascinated by the natural world. Her Uncle Walter was quite an eccentric and he had a, a zebra drawn carriage, which he used to drive through the streets of London. Miriam Charles and Walter Rothschild all had interests which were natural history and conservation and ecology, and their great wealth was used for research. Miriam Rothschild, um, Charles Rothschild and Walter Rothschild were the main members of the family who were interested in conservation and research. The Rothschild name became synonymous with great wealth. They were bankers and had the world's largest art collections, palaces, and all of them were philanthropic. So in the late 18th century, the Rothschild family established European banking and finance houses in London, Paris, Frankfurt, Vienna, and Naples. And by the early 19th century, the Rothschild was the largest private fortune in the world. The Rothschild European banking network made the family more wealthy than many European royal families. They married cousins, so the money was kept in the family. Their financial success was used for property and the Rothschilds built or bought 41 palaces across Europe in the 19th and early 20th century. So they had a vast amount of uh, property. The Rothschilds were all philanthropic and much of the art in the world's museum are actually Rothschild's gifts. Miriam's father died when she was 15 and she became closer to her uncle Walter. 
She was educated at home until the age of 17, and then she demanded to go to school. She attended evening classes in zoology at Chelsea College of Science and Technology, and day classes in literature at Bedford College, London. So um, I want to say something about Miriam Rothschild at Plymouth, uh, MBA Plymouth, where I, I worked. She was a visitor it, from 1928 onwards. And between 1928 and 1933, Miriam Rothschild first visited the MBA Plymouth um, Marine Laboratory on a field course from King's College London. This um, establishment was founded in 1884 and the building opened in 1888. The research objectives of the MBA were to make fundamental studies in marine biology, particularly related to fisheries. The MBA laboratory was the first marine laboratory, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in Plymouth, <coughs> <coughs> and hosted many scientists <coughs> and visiting scientists and several Nobel Prize winners. In 1928 to 33, Miriam Rothschild visited first as a student and then as a researcher at the Marine Lab in Plymouth. She first visited um, from a marine biology on a field course from King's College London. She then returned as an MBA Plymouth research visitor. Of course, she never had to apply for any grants or funding because of her in inherited wealth, which was used for research. She was quite an ordinary MBA visitor in 1930 to the 1950s, apart from the fact that she arrived in a chauffeur driven Rolls Royce. Her research in parasitology is still cited and relevant today. Miriam's first research at Plymouth was on parasites of the Winkle, Littorina Litteria. Yeah. And this has a complicated, this parasite has a complicated life cycle involving a bird, a mollusk and a fish. So the seagull is the host of the adult trematode worm and in, infected when the bird eats infected fish. Larval stages are in the winkle, which is infected by eating bird droppings. And the free swimming saccharial stage are released from the winkle in the seawater. These burrow into fish and insist in fish skin becoming black spots from the reaction of the parasite to the, the fish to the parasite. And then the seagull eats the fish and the adult worm, the little um, larval worms hatch out in the fish's gut and um, become the adult parasite. She studied the way the parasites affect the snail showing that the infected snails migrated more slowly than the non-infected snails and the infected digestive gland was bigger and the whole snail grew bigger and showed other changes in its morphology. The infected snails also produced fewer eggs than the uninfected ones. During the 1930s, she made a name for herself at the Marine Biological Association at Plymouth, studying the mollusk nuclear and its trematode parasites. She published several papers on the subject. She continued her research on parasites of marine snails until her lab was bombed on the 20th and 21st of March in 1941. For the remainder of the war, little research could be conducted at the Citadel Hill Laboratory. Miriam Chen, this shows the devastation caused by the bombing. Miriam changed her scientific research from parasitology to insect ecology. All her parasitology specimens were lost in the bombing. Her new naturalist book on parasitism, Fleas, Flukes and Cuckoos, was a huge success. 
Her other main area of research was the chemical ecology of insects, particularly in mimicry and the sequestering of toxic compounds from plants, in which she was a pioneer. So Miriam also carried out research on fleas. Her father Charles's main interests were butterflies and collecting, flea, collecting butterflies and fleas. He had 30,000 species of fleas in his collection. Miriam's interest in fleas was initiated by Charles, who encouraged her to help him collect fleas from mice. Miriam said, my development to a scientist was due entirely to my father Charles, a first class scientist who discovered the flea vector of plague. In 1903, on a flea collecting expedition to Egypt, he discovered the rodent flea Xenoxylus chiops, <coughs> which he named after the pharaoh <coughs> Cheops. <coughs> Excuse me. The black rat is the host of the plague flea, and the bubonic plague bacterium, Yersinia pestis, from the blood of the black rat is spread by the infected fleas and cheops when it bites. Charles identified the flea from the black rat, which causes plague or black death from the bacterium Yersinia pestis. There are still bubonic plague outbreaks today, but is now treatable with antibiotics. So the flea drinks rat blood that carries the bacteria, the bacteria multiply in the flea's gut, the gut gets clogged with bacteria. The flea bites humans and regurgitates blood into the open wound, containing the bacteria causing infection. When a rat flea ingests a blood meal from a rat infected with the plague bacteria Yersinia pestis, the blood clots in the flea's gut. The bacilli multiply in the blood clot. Then the flea inoculates thousands of these bacilli into the flea bite during subsequent blood meals on humans. During feeding, the flea recurgitates bacteria infected blood. Bacteria then spread to the lymph nodes. The plague or black death is one of the most deadly diseases in human history, claiming an estimated 200 million lives. The most serious documented plague pandemics including in the UK, were in the 14th and 17th centuries. And in the 14th century, the Black Death, which in five years in the middle of the 14th century, killed a third of Europe's population. And in the 17th century, the Great Plague of London, 1664 to six, killed 70,000 people in Southeast England. The plague is important to know about the Black Death in order to understand why they carried out the research on um, flea jumping. It can cause serious infection in three ways. Infection of the lymph glands from a flea bite and the picture shows um, a bubo or a swelling of the lymph gland caused by the flea um, from the bacteria. Infection of the lungs, pneumonic plague, and septicemic plague, infection of the blood. <clears throat> Outbreaks of plague today are usually bubonic plague. Most human cases since the 1990s have occurred in Africa, Democratic Republic of Congo, Madagascar and Peru and China. Globally, between 2010 and 2015, there were 3,248 documented cases and 584 deaths. A rat flea bite infects the lymphatic system with the bacillus, Yersinia pestis. The symptoms are enlarged and inflamed lymph glands around the armpits, neck and groin, depending on the, where the flea bite was sustained. Infected individuals with bubonic plague, which has not been eradicated, and the bubos from the bubonic plague are swollen lymph glands. If the plague bacterium from the blood and lymphatic enters the lungs and develops it into a serious infection, this is known as pneumonic plague and is the second most common form of the Black Death. It has a 95% death rate if not treated with antibiotics. This is spread to person to person through droplet infection, um, like COVID, very 
uh, via coughing and sneezing. It is much more infectious than bubonic plague as there is direct human transmission. And most of the pandemics in the world have involved um, direct human transmission. When the bacilli reach the lung, several pneumonia, severe pneumonia, inflammation of the lung due to infection is caused. Symptoms of pneumonic plague include a cough and fever as the condition develops in the lung, causing breathing to become difficult. Blood infected by bacteria would be expelled into the air from coughing. Septicemic plague is infection of the blood. It occurs, it occurs when the flea bite injects bacteria directly into the bloodstream rather than the lymphatic system. The bacilli multiply in the bloodstream, causing massive damage to the blood and circulatory system. It is almost invariably fatal and less treated quickly with antibiotics. Other symptoms associated with septicemic plague include gangrene resulted in the, from the death of body tissues, usually due to loss of blood supply to the infected area, followed by bacterial invasion. Gangrene causes blackening and death of tissue in the extremities, most commonly in the fingers, toes and nose. The gangrene associated with septicemic plague and the black blotches on the skin give rise to the term black death. Discovering the flea, Xenoxylla chiots, as the bubonic clay plague carrier was the most important discovery of Charles's scientific career. Charles had 30,000 specimens in his flea collection, some of which he bought. These are now at the Natural History Museum in London. In 1914, the Daily Mail newspaper reported that Charles had paid a thousand pounds for a rare flea from the sea otter for his collection. Charles vehemently denied this and, and said um, that he didn't pay that, but he didn't say how much he did pay for the flea. Charles also accidentally purchased dress fleas for his scientific collection and was surprised when they were delivered. He hadn't expected these. Dress fleas were popular in the 18th century, made by Mexican nuns who clothed fleas in elaborate costumes. That must have been really painstaking work. Mexican folk art dress fleas were often given as a wedding gift. And the Zoological Museum at Tring in Hertfordshire has an exhibition of dress Mexican fleas. Um, and one pair are dressed as a bride and groom. Charles was handsome, clever and successful, but was prone to depression. In 1923, following a long debilitating bout of encephalitis, he took his own life and Miriam was devastated at his death. He left his entire flea collection to Miriam, then age 15, for her to catalogue. This work took her 30 years. One of Miriam's principal achievements was the six volume work cataloguing the Ro entire Rothschild flea collection over a 30 year period. These were collected by her father and later donated to the Natural History Museum. Miriam kept her own research fleas in polythene bags in her bedroom to avoid disturbance by her six children. Fleas are wingless, so the jump is important in finding new hosts to feed on. So if you can understand the jumping mechanism, you can stop infections um, with the uh, bacillus causing the black death. So that's why um, research effort was um, devoted to the flea jumping mechanism. Fleas have three pairs of legs, four legs and middle legs are short, and the hind legs are long for jumping. The freeze hut Flea's hind legs are long and well adapted for jumping and can bend at several joints. The fleas stay perfectly still in the dark and only jump when lights go on. Miriam's own research gave a first theory on the flea jumping mechanism. Miriam proposed that fleas push off with their knee or trochanter and the force for jumping is exerted through the flea's knee. But in 1967, Henry Bennett Clark discovered that fleas stored energy needed to jump in an elastic pad of resilin, which works like a spring. 
Bennett Clark argued that fleas push off with their toes, not their knees. And Bennett Clark pu published a paper with this competing hypothesis. In 2011, using high speed recording equipment, Burroughs and Sutton at Cambridge pr proved that fleas use their toes to push off and pr pr propel the body into the air. Video showed that fleas could jump when the knees were not touching the ground. So in 2011, the 40 year old controversy how a flea jumps was now resolved. Fleas take off from their toes, not their knees. Miriam's theory that they use their knees was not correct. But she didn't mind. Uh, she was happy that the research had been carried out and had shown how the fleas were jumping. In 1954, from her interest in fleas, she became known as the Queen of Fleas and served on the government's advisory committee on myxomatosis, a viral disease transmitted by rabbit fleas, which was previously thought to be transmitted by mosquitoes. In 1953, myxomatosis reached the UK from France in, in 1955. 95% of UK rabbits were dead. Myxomatosis was shown to be transmitted by the rabbit flea. Miriam's research on host-specific rabbit fleas Sphylopsis cuniculi revealed that female fleas could not reproduce until they had drawn blood from a pregnant rabbit. Rabbit fleas precisely correlated their breeding cycles to the host rabbit, and rabbits which were pregnant carried many more fleas than those which were not. Then, when the young rabbits were born, the young fleas migrated to the young rabbits and transmitted myxomatosis to them. Her new naturalist book, Fleas, Flukes and Cuckoos, was a great success. Miriam Rothschild carried on her research during the wartime and she was employed by the Ministry of Agriculture in research producing useful products from seaweed, including chicken feed. The research involved seaweed derived chemicals called alginates, extracted from brown seaweeds, laminaria and fucus. Calcium alginates main use is in food and cosmetics as a stabilizer, thickener and emulsifier. Calcium alginate from seaweed was also used to develop a fiber which could be woven into various textiles. Calcium alginate fiber was used in bandages and dressings for large wounds and burns and fireproof wounds and burns and fireproof clothing. It was also used extraordinarily as an experimental fiber for building the de Havilland mosquito plane fuselage. And the de Havilland mosquito was one of the most successful combat aircraft in World War II, and 8,000 were built. Only one seaweed fiber de Havilland mosquito was flown as the material proved unsuitable for use as a fuselage material. Miriam also did World War II research on wood pigeons, Columba Columbus, and found those with darker plumage had tuberculosis of the adrenal glands. There was great concern that the TB might spread among cattle from the pigeons and threaten beef production. So publication of the research was delayed till after the war to avoid anxiety among farmers. Miriam often took her research wood pigeons, Columba Columbus, home to Ashton Wall for study. This led to rumors that Miriam was involved in espionage using carrier pigeons to transmit secret messages. Some carrier pigeons were based at the Bletchley Park site, the main wartime code deciphering centre. Bletchley Park near Milton Keynes, Buckinghamshire was the central site of the UK government code and cipher school. Between 1940 and 1942, Miriam worked at Bletchley Park on the Enigma project to decode German communications sent by the Enigma machine. She was fluent in several European languages, which was very useful. Miriam worked nights in Hut 6, translating German coded messages in the naval section. She signed the Official Secrets Act, so there are no details of her work. 
Miriam was at Bletchley Park for two years. She had German, French and probably Hungarian language skills from her family. Using intensive mathematical and logical analysis to crack codes, Miriam claimed that biologists made an equal contribution to code deciphering to mathematicians. Intelligence produced at Bletchley shortened World War II by two to four years. And Dr. Malcolm and Dr. Molly Spooner from the MBA Plymouth were also at Bletchley Park with Miriam and she would have known them from her time visiting the MBA in Plymouth. During Miriam's two years at Bletchley, she lived in a flat at Mentmore Towers, Buckinghamshire, home of an uncle. Others lived in lodgings in Bletchley Town. Mentmore House belonged to Rothschild relative, Lord Rosebery, and Miriam commuted to Bletchley Park. At Bletchley Park, she met her husband, refugee soldier, Captain George Lanyai, later changed to Lane, who had emigrated from Hungary in 1943. She, and in 1943, she became Mrs. Lane. Miriam was given permission to leave Bletchley after her marriage. And they went on to have two, four daughters and two sons. Um, and two of the daughters were adopted. George Lane's war work in cross channel intelligence gathering meant Miriam was allowed to be billeted with him at training camps on the South Coast. She said that altogether we lived a very peculiar life. We never knew if we would see each other again. It was very hectic. I don't know how I survived it. Her marriage ended in 1957, but Miriam remained a close friend of George after his second marriage and attended some of his um, celebrations. When George Lynn was captured in, and turned as a prisoner of war, Miriam returned to Ashton Wold during the war. Ashton Wold area had been transformed by the arrival of 6,000 US Air Force soldiers at Polborough Airport bordering the Ashton estate. Miriam welcomed and befriended many US American airmen billeted at Ashton Wold, including Clark Gable. Miriam went out shooting with Clark Gable. He shot rooks and she shot targets, as she was a conservationist. She didn't shoot animals. She said he was a crack shot and incredibly good looking and had lots of admirers, but he had no sense of humor at all. So Miriam also carried out research on butterflies after the war. In 1952, she moved her family to Oxford for the children's education. Here she was influenced by Professor E.B. Ford, who guided her research on butterflies and moths. Miriam was a member of the Oxford Genetics School during the 1960s, where she met E.B. Ford, and she campaigned with him for the legislation, legalization of homosexuality. In research with E.B. Ford, she studied the diversity of positioning of eye spots on the wings of meadow brown butterflies. She considered small eye spots on the wings to function to deflect bird predators from the butterfly's body. Flashy eye spots on the central wings were warning coloration associated with unpalatability. Males were less colorful with smaller eye spots and reduced orange areas on the upper forewings. Males were more active than females. Females often presented upper wing eye spots to birds. Females suddenly display colors and patterns, so predators hesitate and the butterfly has a better chance of escaping. This led her to study the way insects generally use <coughs> warning coloration <coughs> to discourage predators. <coughs> Excuse me. Ashton Wall's greenhouses were converted to experimental facilities to house research on butterflies and moths. She had a license to grow cannabis as a caterpillar 
pillar food for the tiger moth caterpillar. Miriam found the tiger moth caterpillars are able to accumulate various chemicals from their plant food. The scarlet tiger moth, Calimorpha dominula, was red and black with black rear wings, it was to warn birds of its noxious taste and that it was poisonous. Bright colored caterpillars and moths were warning signs they were poisonous, so they were se seldom eaten by predators. Miriam's butterflies and moths research on the use of toxic substances from plant food for defensive purposes included the cinnabar moth on ragwort. The ragwort, Jacobea vulgaris, contains alkaloids which are poisonous. Caterpillars absorb toxic bitter tasting alkaloid substances from the pl food plants and assimilate them into their bodies, becoming unpalatable themselves. Ragwort is toxic for horses, an incremental invasive weed in several countries, and studies on the cinnabon moth were to control ragwort. Ragwort toxicity was due to the presence of alkaloids which affect the liver. Alkaloids are not destroyed by drying, and so the plant remains toxic even in hay. Miriam also worked on monarch butterflies. An interesting chemical ecology led Miriam to collaborate with entomologists and chemists around the world. She collaborated with the chemist Tadeus Rickstein on how monarch butterflies become poisonous and unpalatable to birds. Monarch butterfly is called the milkweed butterfly as the caterpillars only eat milk. The monarchs migrate 2000 plus miles. They have summer houses, homes in the US and Canada and over winter in rainforests in Mexico. They're born and they born in the United States and they spend the winter in Mexico. Monarch butterflies and caterpillars are poisonous to birds. Monarch caterpillars diet also provides the butterfly with chemicals that are toxic to birds. They advertise their poisonous nature with bright orange and black colors. Most predators have learned monarch butterflies are poisonous to birds. Adult female butterflies lay eggs which hatch on the underside of milk with leaves. Monarchs extract a substance from milk with weeds similar to the heart stimulant digitalis from foxgloves. Caterpillars and monarchs incorporate toxins from milkweed and become poisonous to bird predators. In 1899 to 1937, butterflies were Uncle Walter's main interest captured or purchased from auction rooms and private collectors. Walter, like Charles, particularly liked swallow butterflies, swallowtail butterflies, giants of the butterfly world. They had an enormous collection. The birdwing swallowtail from Papua New Guinea, Ornithiptera alexandrae, is the largest known butterfly and can fetch 10,000 pounds. It is now a protected species. With a wingspan of eight to 10 inches, butterflies fly high during the day, visiting flowers high in the forest canopy, feeding on nectar and are difficult to catch. In 1906, English explorer and naturalist Albert Meek on a collecting trip for Walter Rothschild in the rainforest of New Guinea saw a bird winged swallowtail. He used a gun to shoot it and the museum type specimen, Queen Alexander's bird wing, Ornithoptera alexandrii has bullet wing holes in its wings. In 1907, Queen Alexander's bird wing, Ornithoptera alexandrii, was named by Walter in honor of Queen Alexandra, wife of Edward VIII, of the seventh. In 1939, after Walter's death, 2.5 million butterflies and moths in thousands of specimen drawers were donated to the Natural History Museum. As I said earlier, Miriam was also a great pioneer of wildflower gardening. She was to replace wild plants destroyed by weed killer. 
In the 1970s, she realized wildflowers were weed killed and fertilized out of fields, and she must do something about it. Wildflowers and grass gardening was adopted at Ashton Wold, a complete and drastic change to her, garden, to her formal gardens. She also promoted conservation of wildflower birches along roads for insects. She campaigned to protect wildflower verges and was a patron of the local wildflower trust. She also campaigned for wildflower gardens in parks using her own seed mix from Ashton Wall, which she called Farmer's Nightmare. 150 acres of meadow garden were planted at home in Ashton Wall to host butterflies and insects she loved. She proposed the idea in the 1970s she promoted the idea of a mix of weeds and garden plants as a fashionable uh, way of gardening. The garden at Ashton Wall mingled wild and cultivated wildflowers. There were no lawns. Wildflower gardens within formal gardens at uh, Ashton Wall were to attract insects and butterflies. She was awarded several medals by the Royal Hultra Cultural Society for meadow wildflowers and cultivated plants. And the Ashton Estate wildflower seeds are still available for sale. And all the profits go to charity. In 1982, she met and corresponded with Prince Charles. She advised Charles on sowing extensive wildflower meadows at Highgrove with her wildflower mix. Charles began to develop wildflower meadows, a radical idea then for a large country house garden. In the Royal Meadow at Highgrove, there was the brainchild of the Prince of Wales and Dave Miriam Rothschild more than 30 years ago, way ahead of its time. And here you can see the flowering meadows at Highgrove, which contain a huge diversity of species. Miriam, in 1983, Miriam wrote The Butterfly Gardener to promote interest in wildflower planting to encourage butterflies. She re recommended butterfly plants, primroses and bluebells in spring, oxeye daisies, scabious chives, mint and lavender and buddleia in the summer. In 1985, Miriam was elected a fellow of the Royal Society and was made a dame in 2000. She received honorary doctorates from eight universities, including Oxford and Cambridge. She was an authority on fleas and butterflies and influential in making environmental protection fashionable. Miriam Rothschild did not consider herself a professional scientist, although she worked with some of the greatest scientists of the time, as she worked at home independently. She did not need grants, even though she worked at home independently, she worked on collaborative projects and many of her published works are with other scientists. A chronic insomnia, she turned working from home to advantage. She looked after her children during the daytime and studied morphology and microscopy at night. She continued her research well into her eighties. She also wrote about 350 papers on entomology, zoology, and numerous books. She campaigned for free milk in schools and the wearing of seat belts in cars. She also served on the committee whose 1963 report resulted in the decriminalization of homosexuality. In 1962, she founded the Schizophrenia Research Fund after the death of her sister from the disease. In March 2006, following Miriam's death, the name of the fund was changed in her memory to the Miriam Rothschild Schizophrenia Research Fund. Miriam was the first woman on National Tr Trust Committee for Conservation and a trustee of the Natural History Museum. She served on committees of the Royal Entomological Society, Zoological Society of London, and the Marine Biological Association Committee. Her home was a meeting place for politicians, writers, and artists, scientists, and students. She loved her dogs 
and farm estate where she was very popular locally. The farm she ran was profitable, the money being used for research. Locally, Miriam helped to establish the world famous Ashton International Conquer Championship every second Sunday in October. Miriam Rothschild could well be described in the same terms she characterized evolutionary biologist George Sean Remains. She was the epitome of 19th century excellence and of a certain type, which has long since disappeared. The amateur scientist, the philosophical naturalist, a woman of means who set up her own laboratory at home and devoted her life to an enthusiastic, passionately sincere quest for the truth. She possessed a gift that she attributed to her father, that she always made other people feel clever. She loved the natural world and said there is no money or public success in zoology, just complete happiness. Miriam lived at Ashton Wall, where she was born all her life. She died there aged 96. She was still carrying out research into her 80s. When asked to name her personal seven wonders of the world, Miriam named the jump of the flea, the monarch butterfly, the tiger moth ear mite, the life cycle of the parasitic worm, halopegus, carotenoid pigments, the Jungfrau in Swiss Alps and Jerusalem in a sandstorm. So to summarize her achievements, she was born on the 5th of August, 1908, tutored at home, in 1928, she began to study at Chelsea Polytechnic. In 1940, she worked for the Foreign Office during the war. In 1943, she married George Lane. And in 1962, she funded, founded the Schizophrenia Research Fund. And in 1967, she was appointed a trustee of the Natural History Museum, serving until 1975. In 1968, she received an honorary doctorate from the University of Oxford, and in 1978, hosted the world's first international flea conference at her home in, 19, in Northamptonshire. She was appointed a CBE. In 1983, she received an honorary doctorate from the University of Gothenburg. In 84, a doctorate from the University of Hull. And in 1985, she delivered the Oxford University Remains Lecture on Animals and Man. In 1985, she was elected to the Royal Society. In 1986, she received an honorary doctorate from the Northwestern University and in 1986, delivered the inaugural John Foster Memorial Lecture. In 87, she received an honorary doctorate from the University of Leicester. In 89, an honorary doctorate from the Open University. And in 89, she was also awarded the medal from the International Society of Chemical Ecology. In 91, she was awarded the Victoria Medal of Honor by the RHS and the Mendel Award in 1993. In 1995, she helped to secure funding for the extension to Madeline Hill Butterfly Conservation Reserve in Hampshire. She opened the National Dragon Fine Museum at Ashton Wall and received an honorary doctorate from the University of Sussex in 1992, when she also received an honorary doctorate from the University of Cambridge. In 2000, she was appointed a DBA. She received a Lifetime Achievement Award for Love of Lepidoptera and Dedication to Nature Conservation and Research on British Butterflies by the British Butterfly Conservation Charity. And in 2005, she died at home aged 96 at, in Ashton Wall, where she was born. And that is the end of my lecture on the life and work of Dame Miriam Rothschild. Oh, brilliant. That was absolutely fantastic, Anne. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I can speak for everyone when I say that the life of Miriam Rothschild sounds absolutely fascinating and that we've all learned a lot today. Now, I'm going to open the floor to some questions from the audience. Uh, like I said at the beginning, you can either submit your questions in the chat or if you'd like, turn on your video and give me a bit of a wave and I'll call on you when I see you. 
Uh, I do, however, request that you do not unmute yourself unless you are about to speak. We'll start off with a question that we've already received in the chat from Betty Suka. She asks, do you think that Miriam has received the credit she deserves for her research? Oh, um, yes, I think definitely she has. Um, if, if you uh, look at the summary that I gave at the end of the talk, you see that she received numerous um, honorary doctorates and honorary awards from um, various universities. And I think that as she was um, an amateur and really had no formal training, then she is more than certainly um, uh, received um, enough uh, um, accolades for her research. Oh, that's brilliant to hear, I think. Yeah, she did. <laughs> she had got more than a few awards, it seems. So it's uh, good to see. Uh, does anyone else have a question at the moment? If you do, you can give me a little wave. Oh, there we go. Michael Davis, take it away. Uh, yes, I was wondering um, if she had been alive today uh, and active in her research, uh, what she would have made of this COVID disease, um, its origins and transmission, and particularly um, the treatment and um, well, which appears vaccination seem to be particularly uh, relevant to that, but certainly the rules affecting um, social spreading amongst humans. What sort of what sort of interest would she have made in this COVID era, and what what could have been her contribution to that? Era? Well, I think that um, if she had been young enough, she would have probably volunteered or been um, seconded to do research on COVID, um, because. Um, from her father's work on the Black Death, there are similarities in the way that the um, pneumonic form of the disease is transmitted. And I think that she would have um, certainly been active in, um, in helping in the research in any way that she could have done. I, I don't know how she would have thought about the way that um, society has responded to the disease, I, I think that she would have certainly been impressed by the speed at which va various vaccines have been developed, which is incredible, you know, cutting the time down to a year and the way that the vaccines have been deployed in um, several countries. Brilliant, thank you, Anne and Michael. Do we have any other questions at the moment? Well, while we wait, I have one for you, actually, Anne. Yeah, I was wondering how common was it to find women working so prominently at the forefront of biology and entomology like Miriam at this time? And oh, it was very uncommon. Okay, very yeah. uncommon. And really, the only reason that she could do it was because she had her own wealth. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, there were very few women working in the field. There were some, but not very many. Mm -hmm. So she could fund her own research. Yeah. I mean, also, I don't know if you would know this, but you know, were there many other women who worked on the Enigma project? Oh, I think, yes, I think there were a lot of women that worked on the Enigma project. I think that they were selected by being the brightest pupils, uh, that many of them were very young and um, they were um, headhunted from schools and colleges. And there were a lot of women working on the Enigma project because a lot of the men were uh, fighting. Fascinating. That's interesting that in times of war, they couldn't exactly be discerning about who they picked to join. So yeah. it was really just the brightest minds they could find who were available. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here from Ian Matthews in the chat. Uh, Ian asks, was she a good teacher to others? And did she encourage her children in natural history? Yes, she was a very good teacher um, and she was a great collaborator as well. I and mean, in most of her published um, work uh, was with other scientists. So 
she was a good teacher and um, collaborator, although I don't think she ever formally took up teaching. She was too busy with her research. And as far as her children are concerned, um, I don't think any of them went into um, natural history, although I'm not sure about that. I don't know. I didn't research um, what her children uh, became. We've got another question here from Jude Harris in the chat. Jude asks, does it seem anachronistic to you that she opposed shooting animals, but presumably had to kill many things in the course of her research? Yeah, it does. It does really, but I suppose that she um, justified it by um, making sure that the research topics that she studied had some real relevance and benefits. Interesting. You know, um, on a similar note, I was wondering, I'm not in science, so forgive me if this is a very silly question, but uh, you mentioned that uh, she and particularly her father had a collection of thousands and thousands of fleas. Would these have been live fleas or does he buy them already dead? How does this oh, they, work? <laughs> uh, um, they were, the, the collection was of dead fleas. Okay. But I mean, she, they did go collecting live fleas. And then they would have probably anesthetized them with ether or something like that. Would much would... good research be able to be conducted on a dead flea? Um, oh, no, the fleas that they conducted their research on were live fleas. Ah, the okay. collection, the collection of fleas okay. were dead fleas, the 30,000 fleas. Brilliant, thank you. I thought that's quite a lot of live fleas to have bouncing yeah. around your house. <laughs> Well, uh, she did have... keep live fleas at her home. Oh, interesting. Kept them in polythene bags in her bedroom <laughs> to stop the children annoying them. <laughs> I suppose she'll never get lonely. Uh, do we have any other questions? Oh, we've got uh, Michael, go ahead. Oh, I believe you're muted, Michael. Okay, yes, I was quite impressed that uh, her colleague uh, collected a butterfly by shooting it with a firearm. Yes. Uh, didn't he have a net at hand? Uh, well, these butterflies uh, were very high up in the tree canopy, and that was the only way that he could get them. But, I mean, there were completely different attitudes to collecting then. And, I mean, we would consider it to be terrible now to go out shooting animals and collecting them just for putting in drawers as specimens. I mean, you know, it's terrible, really, what they did. No, I, was, I wasn't talking about the ethics of it. I was talking about the practicalities. It seems a fairly <laughs> dramatic. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> seems like something out of the Karate Kid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, do we have any more questions? a few seconds to see well it seems that everyone has asked their questions for now uh, so this wraps up the q a and of course the talk so thank you everyone so much for coming tonight and thank you of course dr pulsford for the wonderful talk um, i hope to see you and everyone else at some other brisley talks coming up in the future Oh, and quickly, we've got a question in the chat is, will this be recording be available later on? Yes, it will be. It will be on the virtual BRLSI YouTube channel, I think within several weeks. So you'll be able to rewatch them. All right, well, one more round of applause for Anne. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.